Hey everybody, I uh, hope you're all doing well. We're just, we'll get started in just a minute. We're just gonna admit a few more of our friends that are joining us in the webinar today, and then we'll get started. But thank you for being here and for being on time. That's right on. And for those of you watching the recording, uh, just please reach out afterwards um, as, as we'll discuss and uh, let us know any questions that you have. We'd love for your engagement, uh, even though you're not able to be here today. So we'll give them another minute here and then we'll get started. All right, we will start. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, really excited to have you here. Really excited to be talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, lots of conversations going on around this topic. Uh, we're going to try to bring some practicality to it today uh, for how it might affect your situation, your context, uh, and some of the learnings that we have around that. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar uh, with us, um, we're online business systems. And so we're a digital transformation and cybersecurity company. We believe really strongly that no digital transformation should occur without the word secure in front of it. And so we focus at, on making sure that all digital transformations for our clients are both digitally transformative and done in a way that protects those digital assets and investments. So that security component uh, is something we believe strongly in. Uh, and so uh, my name is Chris Harper. I'll be moderating our conversation today. Um, and uh, I'm an onliner uh, and have been for about five years. And so great to have you here with us today. Um, I've got my colleagues, Tim Siemens, Larry Skelly, Steve Levinson, and Jordan Wiseman, who are going to be presenting today and sharing some practical insights regarding artificial intelligence. Um, what you'll see in our next slide uh, is that online's been in the business of digital transformation, uh, specifically secure digital transformations for, for over 37 years. And so we bring to the market some great services that help clients achieve their digital transformation outcomes and objectives. Uh, and we start uh, with our services. Uh, and so we have our digital advisory services, which focuses on our taking our clients from strategy through to solution. We have our digital studio that works with our digital products. And so those are those really exciting digital assets that you put in front of your customers to drive value for them and value for your organization. And then of course, um, underneath that, we bring all of the capabilities, project management, business analysis, uh, that'll help drive that transformation. Your transformation may also be in the customer engagement or omni-channel contact center experience, uh, could be involved with Salesforce. And so driving some of the, the platform value that these types of solutions bring. And then of course, service management. And tying into that, we have cybersecurity. Uh, so we're able to assess your current security posture uh, and provide guidance on how we can improve that posture to protect your uh, organization from cyber threats. As Steve Levinson has told me many times over the years, and we have him joining us today, uh, the bad guys only have to be right once, but our clients need to be right every single day. And so we help our clients ensure that that probability is maximized. And so, Again, I'm really excited for today's topic, and, and we're going to be going through a conversation. Um, and so if you want to move to the next slide, Jamie, we'll be going through a conversation that is going to focus on applied aspects of artificial intelligence, and that's where we're going to begin uh, with Tim, who's going to talk about artificial intelligence, but those practical use cases that we're observing in organizations. Now, as we talk about these types of transformative changes, we need to be considering the risk, you know, both, both the good risk and the negative risk when it comes to these things. And so Steve Levinson, our Chief Information Security Officer uh, at Online Business Systems is gonna be talking about that important topic of risk when it comes to artificial intelligence. And then we're gonna talk about trust. How do we know we can trust these types of tools? Uh, and what does trust mean in this context? Larry Skelly, um, our director of our innovation lab is going to be speaking about that. And then Jordan Weissman is going to be talking about the very, very unpredictable future that we face today and some practical things we can do today to prepare for that future that has not yet arrived. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. And I'm going to hand it over to Tim, who is going to kick us off with our first point of discussion. And as we're going through these, if you have any questions that come up, please feel free to submit them. We have set aside some time towards the end of the presentation to get into those. So I'll hand it over to you, Tim. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be opening up with more of a, I would call it almost a table setting around how AI is being applied, how we are applying it, what use cases we see, uh, why, why it is um, 
um, of such interest across our user base and our client base. So next slide, please. So um, we have, in our innovation lab, Larry is a director of, we have been working on aspects of artificial intelligence, um, neural networks, machine learning, things of that nature for the last good number of years, five, six years or, or more. Um, and for the most part, um, we're doing interesting work in natural language processing and machine learning and, and things of that nature. But what really changed in um, last year was the introduction of Chat GPT-4. But I don't think I'll be telling people uh, something that, that they don't know. Chat GPT-4 um, was the fastest uh, race to uh, a number, 100 million users in two months uh, for what is basically a, a new technology for people to use. And We've seen we've seen that uh, at online. We see it at our client sites. Um, we would try and do presentations online. We do presentations about one topic, and invariably the topic of ChatGPT would insert itself, and we would be talking about ChatGPT. And that is because people are entranced by the capabilities and what uh, ChatGPT and large language models can enable. And I'd say it the biggest reason it's moved so quickly is because the first mass demonstration of what are the demonstrations of AI to a broad user base made freely available. And so as people used it, the light bulbs would turn on. Um, and, and for me, the first time I used it, it was like the first time I used a spreadsheet. Now, I'll say I'm old enough to have actually lived in a time where there were no spreadsheets. And so when I first saw the first VisiCalc and bought it, my eyes opened to a capability. What can this thing do? Um, and what is this thing I'm talking to? I'm asking it questions and it's giving me answers. Um, and the questions I'm asking it are, they're pretty tough in some cases. There's some background knowledge um, that, 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 is, uh, that it has. It's really intelligent. It's got a huge knowledge base behind it. Um, it's very creative. If I ask it to, to create things for me, it can do that. And it works 24 seven when it's working. Um, I mean, it's had its ups and downs as availability goes, but it's very, very impressive. And then as I, as I used it more and more, and we were using our open AI account and doing, doing more things, then I started to have a different view of it. It's kind of like a, a strange knowledge filled dreamer because, I was, because it could come up with very creative things, but it wouldn't always be right. And uh, Larry will talk a little bit more about that coming up, but, that, but it's still like very impressive in terms of what sort of um, ideas it could uh, come up with. And I, I wrote a number of, of blogs here, the company sort of trying to describe what's it like working with it. And the analogy I used and that graphic there of the wizard speaking to something which looks like a computer um, is we become, um, as we use it, we become um, knowledgeable in how to do incantations or prompt engineering to ask the questions in the right way to get the results that we want. And when you do, man, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. So ChatGPT has grown very, very quickly, um, and and it it is uh, it does represent um, the beginnings of an inflection point as regards to the way the end users understand what can computers can do for them and what it can do for them. And that and that that is really the the big talk. People are trying to understand how do I make this work for me and my um, my business. Let's next. Let's go to the next slide, please. So generative AI, which ChatGPT is a part of, it can do a number of really big things. Um, it can offload some of the cognitive processing demands that, that business users or other users in general have. It can, it, you can ask it questions to guide you in analysis of data, to aid you in making decisions. It can do things that a data scientist might've been able to do, but it can do you it can do this for you in a very natural uh, English language or other language manner. Um, depending upon the nature of a mathematical or other problem, logic problem, it can help in solving some of those, those logic problems. And the biggest thing that it allows, uh, that it's going to allow people to do is maximize the, the effective cognitive processing time that people already have in a day. So if you can, on a given day, if you've got, you know, five, eight hours, I'll be um, generous here, a really high performing um, cognitive processing time. Um, you can take full advantage of that cognitive processing time by having ChatGPT or large language models augment the way that you work. Um, 
they've run, as many people see, they've run ChatGPT through a variety of different, whether it's LSATs or SATs or MCATs or other testing uh, things, and it does quite well on those tests. Um, they've run it through an IQ test, um, and on a verbal level, it kind of tests out at about 155, which is pretty good. So it's nice having uh, an assistant like that who can think at a high rate um, and produce results for you much faster than you'd be able to do yourself and be a very good writer. So, so you, you can also understand how having a tool like that or inter actually interacting with a tool like that can allow you to learn things faster. I have learned things like how to stop my lawnmower from pulsing as it's running. Um, you would think maybe ChatGPT wouldn't know how to do that, but it does know how to do that, and it can help me with that. But take that to your everyday tasks, such as you're having a, um, you want to know, I'm going to have, uh, let's say, a somewhat uh, difficult conversation with somebody. Does ChatGPT have some advice for you? Well, ask it, and it will provide you some advice. Um, it it also has this creativity um, um, capability to it. It's got the ability to really brainstorm ideas that you may have and come up with alternatives that you might not have thought were, were activities. And it can do it very quickly. We all do it, do it ourselves, but sometimes it's nice to have something, create a whole bunch of alternatives that we didn't really think of. Now, when you ask uh, uh, LLM, large language model, to be creative for you, if you like what it produces, um, you call that a good creative result. If you don't like what it produces, you call that a hallucination. Um, and so there's a yin and a yang there. It can be really creative, but if you wanted it to be really deterministic and come up with very accurate answers on things, well, it, th there are difficulties making it perform in that manner. You have to understand what those difficulties are and trying to overcome them. Um, next slide, please. So in the enterprise, if you take a look at these large language models, how can they be used? What are some of the use cases? Well, the, the big one, and the first one we we're applying it to here was in text analysis use cases, whether that is summarization of written documentation or communications or large PDFs, um, doing question and answer against those summarized materials. So if you can imagine downloading something like the equivalent of a, a very large request for a proposal and being able to analyze that ask questions of the request for proposal, get meaningful answers out of it. Just Those are just two, two, two examples. Um, um, that, that can add a lot of value. Even things such as, in my example, that analyze this survey and then provide the data. It can do things like that. Now, it won't do it perfectly all the time. As a matter of fact, almost guaranteed it won't do it perfectly all the time. But a lot of times, it do 80 to 90 percent correct. And for most people, that's that's pretty good. They can they can go back and edit the process and and ensure that it's actually correct. Um, it can do classification or sentiment detection extremely well. Um, I've used it, an, an example for me, um, I had a list of, of our own client names, and I knew that a bunch of them had not been classified correctly in terms of what uh, business domain they're in, whether it's agribusiness or whether it's finance, banking, things of that nature. Well, you can actually, just given those client names, ask uh, ChatGPT, hey, if you had to guess what industry each of these clients was in, what would your guess be? And it comes back with a pretty pretty darn good guess as to what that is. So in data classification and sentiment detection of, of an emotional communication, it can do a fantastic job. Um, for us, we use uh, ChatGPT and Copilot X for our own internal systems development. Um, we use it to maintain systems that, we've already, that we are we built up over years and we use it to help in creating new systems. And we're seeing good uh, increases in uh, productivity of our software developers, but it does take time to get into having this little coding assistant with you, providing you with recommendations. And, and you have to work with it to figure out how is it best work uh, for you as a developer, whether it's writing QA test cases or things of that nature, um, you can really get uh, benefit out of it. In the sales process cycle, again, I would, you know, I've seen examples where you can provide financial statements for cli of, of clients for publicly traded companies. You can ask those financial statements for, for uh, important KPIs if you're doing an analysis of that company. You can, and you can actually then even compare uh, company, one company versus another company. These are things that kind of come built into the large language model itself. And a last case, enterprise er, uh, information search. You can take your own documents uh, in, a, in a manner and you can bring them to the party to do intelligent search against uh, your own data or your own unstructured data, which is a, a common use pattern. 
um, and and get more and more value out of it. Um, next slide, please. So in my role as CTO, Chief Technology Officer here, I'm kind of responsible for kind of exploring new technologies or methods and determining what's the best way for us as a company to either to adopt or use them, or how do we incorporate them, them into the systems that we're building. So a big part of that is understanding what's actually currently feasible. And GPT and the large language models have really changed what is feasible, and they've changed it very quickly. Um, so in terms of trying to figure out, okay, what can we do this week versus what couldn't we do last week? This is a fast moving space. So last week, you may not have been able to do classification well enough to incorporate it into a production system. This week, it might be good enough for you to incorporate it into a conversational agent or something of that nature using the, these uh, either different software or different approaches to solving it. Um, and I, so I, I have to understand what's feasible, what's beneficial, and how can we use these uh, technologies to actually create systems which um, um, are a benefit to our clients and benefits to ourselves. I also have to, to determine how do we use uh, generative AI to augment our people themselves, to increase their productivity as that augmented agent. So we've got advisory and policy here around how to uh, use these uh, large language models. Um, and, and then we have educational sessions to, to teach them how to use them in an ethical and responsible way. Also prior to, you need to prioritize your generative AI initiatives. It's, it's such a broad field that um, you could easily do many, many things um, without actually having taken a look at this weight between what's, what is actually feasible and what kind of benefit would we get? And you know, benefits such as how could I re reduce the cost of a process? How could I increase the revenue of, of a sales process or, or other process? How could I increase my service quality around customer experience? You can, uh, generative AI can, can add benefit to each one of these things, but some parts of generative AI are more advanced um, and can more immediately provide value in a shorter time cycle. So our innovation lab and as a company, we need to be on, on top of what those things are and we continually do that. And then also ensuring that we're using Gen AI responsibly. You need to have policy and governments and governance um, in place for, for your company in terms of usage. Um, I know Steve um, and others will talk in more depth about that. But I also am responsible for provisioning some automated services that enable that policy and government governance in a more automated fashion. An example might be um, using, um, as, as regards to ChatGPT from OpenAI, maybe you use Microsoft OpenAI Azure services for sensitive intellectual property or searches or software development that you're conducting. So I need, need to kind of stay on top of what all these, these, uh, um, these technologies are and what can actually be done. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Steve. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And I'll say you know, today I have the, the pleasure of, uh, of not having to take too much uh, floor time here because all three of my counterparts are, are doing a, a great job of covering some of the things that one ought to consider from a security perspective you know, as it pertains to, to AI. So, so relatively speaking, my chunk here will be the shortest. So as I was kind of thinking through this, and obviously I've talked with tons of my peers, you know, friends, um, clients, partners alike, because it's such an interesting technology and how quickly, you know, things are changing. So it's, it's not just an IT conversation anymore. Really, it's a, it's a human conversation. We're, we're all talking about how it impacts our lives. So, you know, from my perspective, we're in security hype. Um, we try to look at it as, okay, well, what could possibly go wrong or uh, what's the speed of dark here? And I was, as I was thinking about this just the other day where I kind of changed my, my presentation up a little bit, I thought, you know, I think I would cover it from the three basic tenets of security. So CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So um, with that, if you want to go to the next slide, Jamie. The one after this. Okay, so confidentiality. So more and more folks are starting to use various forms of, of AI, be it chat GPT or whatever other flavor best suits your fancy. And again, it's it's a very powerful tool and it can help us iterate uh, you know, that much more quickly. 
Uh, some of the things we really need to consider, though, is that, uh, you know, in some cases, especially if it's a, a public type of AI, that information that we are plugging in could include confidential information about our clients, about our personnel, maybe about our partners. And so we have to be really careful about what is in those data sets to make sure that it's not something that could inadvertently leak out there. So you know, data sanit you know, sanitizing is going to become increasingly important. We can't just be lazy and take data sets and put them out there. I mean, if you want to just kind of cut through the chase, just imagine that you're taking whatever it is you have and you're posting it out on the Internet. And I know it's not quite that simple and that it may take a few extra steps for others' eyeballs to see what you're putting there. But if it is some sort of public-facing type of AI vehicle that you're using, it would be a strong consideration that you, you need to, to look at. Now, there will be, and more and more companies will start investing this, where they'll be able to use the, the power of AI to do it internally. So it may become less of a risk if you're able to use those vehicles just internally within your own organization. But still, you know, other things to consider is that, well, A, it's possible still that that could leak out there if something, you know, if a hole gets poked where it allows it to get out to the bigger world. Or B, um, it may allow for some folks within an organization to see data sets that really they shouldn't be seeing. So there's just a lot of things to consider as it pertains to adequately, adequately protecting, you know, any sort of sensitive data. Um, another thing to consider, especially if you're using public facing AI, is that um, while maybe it won't allow for reverse engineering as we all have come to know in, you know, and see happen out there in the technical arena, it may allow for, you know, really savvy, um, call it, uh, you know, shadow attackers to be able to, you know, my words, uh, you know, catch onto your vapor trail. So maybe they're just one step behind you and they're asking similar questions of any sort of AI engines that you would be asking so that that time, uh, that time advantage for you being an early mover and shaker of doing, you know, whatever, you know, intellectual things you're doing to, to, you know, to harness the power of AI, there might be somebody right on your footsteps now. They're just kind of riding on your coattails. So just another thing to consider as you're using uh, public vehicles of, of artificial intelligence. So on to the next slide as we talk about integrity. And, you know, yes, there is a heck of a lot of power in the world of using artificial intelligence. And I think it's going to allow us to iterate that much more quickly. But keep in mind too, a lot of the data that's put in there is data that's been generated by humans. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily completely accurate. Heck, I mean, if you wanna look at it from a, another level, let's look at how a lot of us accept our, our news feeds now. And a lot of times people will just, you know, be you know, the left wing to right wing, you're just gonna kind of follow whatever flavor suits your fancy. And it may not be entirely accurate. So I think what'll become more and more critical here is that the art of critical thinking to really take a look at what you have. It may or may not make sense, but do additional research around it. You know, I used to say, you know, trust but verify, but I think in today's world, it's more don't trust it until you verify it. So don't be lazy. You know, do, do your, you know, check your work, make sure that whatever you think may be true from, you know, from the power of AI and, and machine learning actually kind of aligns with the reality. So yeah, I think we all owe it to ourselves and our businesses and even to society to just do those extra few things to make sure that we're basing whatever it is we are creating or iterating on, on, on reality and not on just something that sounded kind of cool. So I think what'll happen is uh, it'll be that much more important to figure out um, reasonable ways to test our hypotheses. and. And, and back to critical thinking, I think that will become more and more important to us, you know, as a society is, look, we're, we are flooded with information now, right? When we were kids, you just go to the encyclopedia and that was kind of the truth, right? And now there's just, you know, millions of sources of information and with AI and machine learning, it's going to make it that much easier to get our fingers on it. But again, it doesn't mean that it's right. So I think a key takeaway 
in the world of integrity, it's just think through it. You know, do your legwork, make sure that you feel confident that your data sets are, are accurate or the conclusions that have been drawn from using your data sets seem reasonable. Then, of course, the last uh, triad here, if you want to switch slides, Jamie, will be confidence availability. And, you know, in the early days of, of, you know, AI and machine learning, it may not be quite as critical. A lot of us are using it, as we are in our innovation lab, we're using it to build cool new stuff. But as we become more operational and as it somehow gets built in to, the, you know, to the everyday things that we do, we need to make sure that we have some sort of backup plan so that if there is, say, an internet outage or a denial of service or something like that, that we haven't you know, left our brain outside the door. So it's going to be very important to have some sort of backup plan so that if there are any you know, possibilities of, of things not being as readily available as we'd like them to be, that we our organizations, whatever they may be doing, could still be functional. So I think you know, that will become increasingly important as we continue to iterate and build more machine learning and AI into the everyday things that we do. Um, and finally, um, the last slide that I have to present here is kind of pertains to just some of the, the groundwork is, you know, oftentimes um, technology evolves faster than our you know, human Case capabilities are to interpret what that means and what can go wrong, and, and and along those lines also to build applicable and appropriate policies and procedures to kind of think through these things. Um, you know, as I, again, as I've talked with a lot of our clients and partners, especially in the last couple of months, I, I've asked, "Hey, do you guys have a policy about AI?" And I'd say, at least in recent times, it's been maybe ten percent of our clients or partners that develop AI related policies, you know, use policies, what what their employees or partners should or shouldn't do in the world of AI. And while that's not going to perfectly protect your organization, it, it at least provides a good direction so that people kind of know what song book they ought to be singing from. Um, so with that said, uh, we actually created our own, we'll call it our .o version of an AI policy. Uh, Jordan and Jordan Wiseman and I spent some time actually using ChatGPT to at least give us a whole bunch of ideas for creating our policy. And again, it probably helped us with 80 plus percent of it, but we took it across the finish line, building in um, some of our own wisdom as well as tying it into how online business systems does what we do. So we've created a good .o version of the policy, which Chris alluded to before. It will make it free to anybody who wants it. We're happy to share it, knowing that, look, within the next, uh, heck, probably within the next few months, this policy will already be semi-outdated and we'll have to keep iterating it. While most security policies and procedures are pretty set in stone and you only have to change them a little bit from time to time, uh, in the world of AI, I do think that we'll all be revisiting our policies and procedures that much more frequently in these early days as we are figuring it all out. So with that, uh, ready to pass the baton uh, back to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to uh, drill down a little bit more deeper to some little security topics um, and focus on trust. What do you need to do to build an LLM based application that your business trusts, that IT trusts, and that your users trust? So let's go to the next slide. I love this uh, quote from Canadian ast astronaut Chris Hadfield. He's one of the few people in the world that has taken the Soyuz rocket to stay on the Mir space station. And uh, he uh, captained multiple shuttle flights to the ISS. And when he talks about space, he says, there's no problem so bad that you cannot make it worse. And he knows that from experience. And I, I liken using AI and gaining your customer's trust and, and keeping that trust uh, where you brand values align with those of your customers to a, to a similar problem. AI has been challenging to use in, in those kinds of scenarios. Um, but now we have this new technology, large language models, LLMs. Meet my new LLM agent. What, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's see what could go wrong. Let's go to the next slide. So why is this critical? Um, 
virtually every task that a knowledge worker does begins with natural language. And if we can better understand the intent of what someone's trying to do, then the whole rest of the, the, the processing performs better. And that comes from Google research into image generation, where every dollar spent on the natural language processing part of the pipeline to understand the intent of the user vastly outperformed a dollar spent on the actual image generation component of the pipeline. So natural language is going to be critical to everything we do. LLMs will front end most things we do. In fact, LLMs uh, to some degree are going to disappear. You use your computer today, you have a CPU, you probably have a GPU, and I think fairly quickly you're going to have an LPU. You can have a language processing unit that is a voice interface with phones and, and laptops, and it will be built into the hardware initially, and it'll run without connections to the internet. It'll, it'll, it'll carry on conversations to communicate with the rest of the platform. The way we use uh, LLMs in the lab, and we're currently building solutions for customers, we're also building LLM-based products for startups, is we leverage their conversational ability. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't trust what they know. We don't trust what they're going to do, but they're extremely good conversationalists. I like to use the term linguistic supremacy. It's a Swiss army knife uh, of natural language processing that easily does things that a year ago specialized models could not do very well. It has a veneer of reasoning and common sense, um, not super deep, although that's improving. Um, and when I say reasoning, I'm talking about emulating reasoning. Jordan will probably talk about this. These models don't understand anything. They emulate understanding through a statistical process embedded in the models. They're emulating understanding. They're emulating uh, what they know, but they're quite good at that. And if used properly, you can build some some pretty incredible enterprise class applications using them. So we use them for carrying on conversations. We give them what I call agency, which is the ability to accomplish a task and to converse the way they need to converse in order to do that. But we don't give them too much freedom. If you give an LLM too much rope, it'll hang itself. And I'm sure you've all seen examples of that. And they're very seductive. What you've been able to do with chat GPT is seductive, but that's not an enterprise class application. In most applications that are built, and we use a, an architecture that's called in-context learning, the LLM prompts that go to the model contain a blend of data and commands. Conversation mixed in with commands commanding the LLM what we want to do. And that makes a very big attack surface, which creates a, a new problem attack surface both in the software and in the underlying processing, the, the services and, and, and uh, infrastructure that, that supports the LLM. So our philosophy is we must consider the LLM and any content and data accesses to be untrusted. Untrusted because lurking in that content data could be uh, malicious, malicious content, malicious commands. Next slide. As a business stakeholder, uh, you need to trust it if you're going to deploy it. We've worked with companies who have spent, you know, fairly large amounts on building AI solutions before that the business didn't take live because it wasn't explainable. They couldn't explain how it was uh, inferring what it inferred. And we have the same issue here. So you need to trust it to represent your brand values to your customer. Um, it can't uh, get into side conversations that you don't want to have. It can't make commitments you don't want it to have. It can't discuss topics that you that you blacklist that you don't want to talk about. You need it to, uh, to, to, to be your trusted representative. To guide critical business decisions, it needs to be explainable. The problem with LMs today is that they're a black box. The vendors that make the large foundation models they do not know how they work, and they, they readily admit this every day. They're suggesting to universities that that would be a great avenue for university research uh, is to help them understand how these things are behaving. All they know is that in the large language models between GPT-1 and GPT-2, when the parameter space grew and the model became bigger, skills emerged. They don't know how these skills function. You want it to be factual, not hallucinate. We've all seen it hallucinate and, and invent facts or come up with untruths. We also know that its knowledge is limited in scope and it's as of a certain date. 
Uh, so we don't rely uh, for, for facts other than basic facts to support conversations. We want to stay sane. You've probably worked with GPT and you've seen it get stuck in a groove where it insists uh, on saying something until you point out to it that it's wrong. And it says, oh, you're right. And it will rework the answer. Um, but but they have a habit of getting stuck in that groove. They have, they have no way to get out. We want it to be unbiased, which is partly the data set it's trained on, but but we have some ways to moderate that. Uh, we want to disallow unsafe or inappropriate content and discussions. And in fact, the foundation model providers have misuse and abuse guardrails built into the models, uh, and they will they'll turn off your access if 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 you're misusing the model for things that they don't approve of. Um, and we want to avoid controversial topics and content. We want it to resist advert adversarial discussions um, and uh, it needs to do all these things in order to be a trusted representative to the business. Next slide, please. Let's talk about IT. As an IT person, I'm used to debugging code, walking through code, understanding how an algorithm works as I test it and I use it. You can't do it with these. They're black boxes. There's no transparency yet, so that's a um, it remains to be a problem to be solved. You want it to act reliably in a deterministic way. There's no determinism here. These models, uh, they're they're generating. They're not following rules. You cannot implement a hundred percent reliable, hard and fast rule in a discussion with an LLM. It will always find a way to to go off on a tangent. And if I do something as simple as I use a, a a single word, like instead of I say question and answer, I say therapy, that causes one of our LLMs to basically melt down and 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 give up on all its, all its rules and try and treat the user in a very soft way that 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 we're not trying to do for parts of our session. So they're very sensitive to what you put in prompts. You need to protect private data. Um, you need to put it into models in, in, in ways that it can't, uh, it can't be siphoned out. It needs to be secure. Uh, you need to resist attacks such as prompt injection. You, you're probably familiar with the SQL Server, uh, uh, SQL injection attacks on web applications. That's why we have web application firewalls. There's a similar attack for LLMs, which is prompt injection, which is uh, injecting prompts in your reply to the model that try and break through the guardrails of the LLM. And I expect that we'll see a complete new um, application stack for LLM construction, including things like um, um, language firewalls to, to support against these things, like we have WAS today, web application firewalls. You want to guard against jailbreaking um, and, and getting into the internals of your application. You want to guard against a user who's asking about implementation details that the LLM might know based on the prompts that you've been giving it. And then as Steve alluded to, we've got these other non-functionals that we need to worry about. Capacity, performance, uh, scalability, in our case, to hundreds of thousands of sessions, uh, absolute reliability, uh, and four nines availability. So these are the, the, the goals that IT wants in order to uh, to transition an application built using these kinds of things into a production scenario. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? And uh, we have a, a team that's been building applications uh, every day, all day uh, for about nine months now uh, using LMs. And, um, you know, normally I would say when we talk about the lab, um, we'd like you to bring an you know, novel, we'd like you to bring business problems you don't know how to solve, and we'll find a novel technology um, to help you solve that problem. This is a little different. Um, in this case, we have a technology, and although I wouldn't normally suggest to go start using technology without having a business problem you're trying to solve, this is a new kind of hammer that we've never had before. And I think you need to get your hands dirty and just use it and start uh, going around and banging on things and seeing what you can do with it. It's going to give you a lot of ideas on how you can use this in your business. So let's start at the bottom, the large foundation models. So these are models from uh, Meta, Llama, uh, from Google, Bard, for example, and from OpenAI. 
they're virtually the only companies that can afford to build these large foundation models now. They take engineering teams of a couple hundred people and a couple of years to train and you know many, many tens of millions of dollars. Uh, but they're building safety guardrails into these. They're improving these all the time. Um, so they they have models that are used for moderation, for making sure that uh, there isn't unsafe content flowing through the model. They have their misuse and privacy filters. If we're testing certain of our apps, we actually have to request to get those turned off so we don't we don't get in trouble. Um, and they have reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is one of the four stages originally used to train the model, where they they've used uh, people to generate 100,000 um, uh, responses to prompts and to score them um, as to whether they're acceptable or not acceptable. So these things have huge amounts of training going into them now. The majority of the training is through human generated cases, the majority of the effort right now. You can also fine tune a model. You can add private content to it. We prefer to use what we call in context learning where we inject private content into, into, into the prompts that we're building. We, we use um, uh, vector databases and and we embed, which is like a type of semantic indexing of content, inject them into prompts. And that's how we maintain our our uh, absolute facts and, and, and private knowledge. Uh, you can play with hyperparameters like temperature, if you're familiar with that, it controls how creative the model is. You can make it act a little more deterministic. There are many, many, many techniques around magic incantations, as Tim called them, prompt engineering, a few shot prompting, um, you can uh, tell it to explain itself and give citations. You can give it a whitelist and blacklist of topics. We have models that we give it very specific personas and tones that we want the agent to to uh, to to exhibit in conversations. It's very, very good at that. And we built a framework for um, what I would call conversational workflows that um, guides the use of the LOM, controls the LOM, uses the LOM for decision making for analysis for routing and of course for conversing with with, with the end user and in that we do things like reflection where we have a second LLM that assesses the output of the first LLM to verify that it's following our rules because it's impossible to make it follow your rules 100 percent you can use multiple LLMs um, just like they do in highly highly uh, available systems like um, the, the space shuttle where they have uh, triplication and voting we can use multiple LLMs and have them vote on what the appropriate output is um, because they're not 100% deterministic. And there are ways that we can detect uh, hallucination um, and insanity and deal with that uh, similarly. And then finally, um, you need to put guardrails around your conversations. You need to uh, you need to filter out prompt injections. Um, you need to monitor the topics need to monitor that safe conversations are occurring. So all these things need to get built around your use of this core API to build a real LLM based application, not something where you sit down at chat GPT and have, have a free conversation, but where you can accomplish a business goal, guiding the model very explicitly and controlling it and giving it agency. As I said, just enough rope to to complete your task, but not enough rope that it's going to get itself into 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 trouble. So these are some of the things that we're we're building and applying in the solutions that that we're doing for our customers. Uh, I think there's one more slide. Right. So as our systems get smarter and they take on more of our tasks with AI, we need to uh, we need to keep that balance to maintain trust. They need to act and become even more human to maintain that trust. Uh, LMs enable was not possible for an agent um, that can follow a customer profile and change dynamically to earn that trust with higher levels of emotional awareness that significantly outperform humans um, and empathy and humanistic tendencies that they exhibit. They emulate this, but they're very good at exhibiting this in discussions that we're seeing in the you know in the healthcare space. Um, so. I think if 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 you apply the proper safeguards and the proper uh, architecture to this, then you're getting an ability that you've never had before, and that's um, a highly humanistic and adoptable uh, interface with 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 your customers. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jordan Wiseman. 
Thanks, Larry. Um, so let's talk a minute now about, you know, the unknown scenarios. And you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how companies are, are practically using these solutions, some of the, the the concerns about doing so and the things to keep in mind and, and kind of ways of, of doing that and, and encouraging trust. I'm not going to spend to guess at how we're going to use AI in the future. I mean, frankly, we've been doing that for for years since science fiction first brought up the ideas of artificial intelligence, and we had you know uh, computer vision kind of experiments in the first half of the 20th century. To just a year or two ago, when we didn't really, you know, there there were a lot of of you know guessing about about what AI will and won't be able to do. And as we all know today, it, it's capable now of things that that. Um, we didn't anticipate and things that, um, you know, some of the things that we hoped it would do and, and do very well, um, there, there's still some problems and things we're working out. What I really want to focus on with, with this, this idea of, of kind of looking for into the future is let's look at some practical examples of, of, of kind of what the, the, you know, how, how, how things kind of went, some things to, to keep in mind, and then we'll talk about some general ideas for, for not necessarily, I won't, I won't use terms like future proofing, but maybe preparing for dealing with some of this kind of stuff. Um, let's go on to the next slide, please. So as we talked about, AI is changing the world. Um, it's changing the world rapidly. Um, faster than people were probably prepared for, um, and and it's still to the point where we've already discovered a lot about what it can do and and what it can't do, and yet people are still making claims, you know, that it's going to do these amazing amazing things. You know, it's it's important that we remember that, like any other advanced or, or, or new technology, AI is a tool. It, it's not magic. It won't solve all our problems. And like any other tool, someone has to use it. They have to know how to use it correctly. They have to know how to apply it correctly. Um, but despite all of that, you know, that, that kind of good information, we're, we're still, as, as I said, putting a lot of proverbial carts before many proverbial horses heading down one hill, multiple hills. I mean, there's, there's just still a lot of unknown. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And good news. You're already using AI, whether you want to or not, whether you realize it or not. Um, the main companies out there behind a lot of the software products we use every day, Microsoft, Apple, Google, so on, they are integrating AI into their platforms. AI is built into Office. That's where some of the text prediction capability has evolved to over time when you're writing emails or writing Word documents or working in, in you know, PowerPoint when you have things like designer telling you how to make things prettier or more attractive. Um, Microsoft and Google are including it now as integrated components of the browsers that they use. They've AI technologies have been built into your your cell phones, whether you have an Android device or an iPhone for several years now. Some of the things that the devices do now to anticipate and 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 track how you use the device to use adaptive charging, adaptive brightness, all that kind of stuff is all a, a form of, of AI. Um, so do you really know how you're using it today? And can you guess how you're going to be using it tomorrow and kind of what that means and the things you might need to prepare for? And th these are things to keep in mind in terms of of while we're 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 putting all those carts before the horses and we're moving very very fast it's also probably not possible to slow down or stop it so we need to prepare and deal with it um let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about how these things have gone a little awry recently so this first example is a, a an organization getting back at some of the healthcare use as Larry talked about before these folks were trying to do a very good thing um, folks who need help with when they have eating disorders, you know, and like any other um, chronic condition you might have to manage, um, they, they need help 24-7. They need help from, from people or, or from a, a resource that doesn't have bad days, will treat everybody with respect and compassion, and, and the models are very, very good at, at simulating that. Um, but they're built on knowledge. The AI models we've fed a lot of data to, and we have, have – um, built them primarily on that, but they didn't go through the same kind of training that health professionals have gone through. They don't have the experience behind that. They don't really empathize with people. Um, so they can seem empathetic. They can seem compassionate, but they, they aren't really. Um, they can't anticipate the impact of, of, of their outputs and what they're saying and how it's going to, to affect an individual that they're telling it to. So this is example is one where the National Eating Disorders Association was creating a bot that, that people could call, they could chat with, they could reach out to for help. And their anticipation was that, hey, we, we, we have a lot of good information on how to, to help people through issues and episodes related to eating disorders. Well, 
it turns out that just knowing, having the knowledge, but not the experience to apply it actively and, and, and not the um, years and years of training and practical experience and, and practice that comes with actually becoming a dietitian or a nutritionist or a physician is, is um, the knowledge alone is not enough. Um, the, the, the model started giving advice that no, that no physician or coach or dietitian would have ever told a patient because they're harmful. They did more harm than good, and they, they had the potential to exacerbate issues. So thankfully, um, they caught it during their beta testing right when it was released and were able to pull it back. Um, but they were really, really quickly heading towards the point where they thought the model was going to be able to take over and they wouldn't have to maintain their staff of, of human um, humans running the, the, the hotline or, or the chat things anymore. Um, and, and that could have led to one of those situations where if they got rid of everybody all they had was the model and it was becoming a problem, that could have been an existential issue for, for this particular organization. So this is one of those ways where the, the promise of AI is there and, and the ideas of what we want to use it for are there, but there are definitely um, you know, the areas and times to take, you know, kind of baby steps heading down that place. Um, let's go on the next slide and talk about another kind of recent example. Um, this is one, and, and you guys might have seen this one on the news as well. Um, a, a lawyer used ChatGPT to to help him write a, a brief in arguments for a case, and it created, you know, one of the things we do is as as when you when you're doing legal research is you you try to find case law. What other um, previous existing, you know, cases, things that have been before court judgments and so on, were with cases whose facts are similar enough to yours that you can leverage the reasoning used in those cases to, um, as the basis for your argument that you can try to convince the court, hey, this case right now is very similar to this other case. Here's what I think that the issues are. And, and, and that becomes part of your argument. Well, again, having the knowledge isn't the same thing as having the experience in the process to do it. The AI model itself didn't actually do legal research. It didn't do a process we we call shepherdizing, um, which is where you actually look at the prior case law and you determine, hey, what other cases cited this one? Were the judgments using those cases favorable or not? Were there different interpretations of those, 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 those laws that matter? Um, additionally, because the AI systems are built on knowledge and knowledge alone, they have an implicit trust in their own data sets and they, they assume its sources. And what I mean by that fragment there is that they don't question whether the data they have is accurate. They assume it is. They don't question whether their interpretation of that data insofar as it's actually interpretation, not just you know a, a, a analysis of, of intent, um, is also accurate. And in fact, they, they, um, this particular lawyer got got in, in in trouble and may may face some some sanctions from from the bar because the citations that the model gave him weren't real case law, which is a huge problem. So in in typical legal research, when you're doing this kind of stuff, you you have you know paralegals and associates and stuff that and 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 legal scholars that will do some of the research for you and help pull this stuff together. But before you take it to court, before you take it you know to to whatever your filing is going to be, whatever your action is going to be you review it you make sure it's all accurate are are the cases not just real but applicable and and, and so on so just like with anything else with ai you know one thing you, or any, any anything else that we've been doing for for hundreds of years if you have a process where you would need to check or double check the work that a human does you should do the same thing with ai one of the interesting side effects of introducing these ai systems that are based on on, on knowledge but that lack the experience is that we've created um workers junior workers systems whatever you want to refer to it as but but effectively they're unconsciously incompetent which means they don't they don't know what they don't know um they make a lot of those those assumptions and so you, you can't really um you, you shouldn't put so much implicit trust in in them certainly not the same amount of trust that they're doing so let's go on to the next one kind of hammer that home a bit um if you check, if you need to check what a human's doing, you should check what your AI is doing too. This is a perfect example. These these screenshots here actually came from a conversation that 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 my partner was having with ChatGPT specifically. She was asking it for quotes related to specific topics she's working at in in the healthcare space, and she got these quotes back and and she asked it for citations. You know, hey, where did these quotes come from? Who said them? You know, what URLs do you have? And and the the model studiously you know gave her the, those details. So then she went to sort to uh, uh, validate the source of information, couldn't find any of it anywhere. She found individuals, but not evidence that they had actually said the things that the model said. And so she asked it, did any of those people that you told me actually say what was quoted? And the model had to admit that, you know, it's not really sure. Um, and where it couldn't find an actual quote, 
it manufactured one that sounded like the person who would have said it said it. In other words, it made it up. So uh, an important thing to, to recognize here is that, you know, as, as Tim said before, when these models, um, when we don't like the output from them, we say that they're, that they're hallucinating or they're, they're making something up. But when it's a when it's pure fabrication, it's not necessarily hallucination, but it's potentially just as as, as problematic. And let's go on to the next slide. We've got a couple minutes left. I'm trying to get through the, the last couple of stuff. So we, we recognize that there's issues and and how people are going to be using these things. Uh, uh, um, there's going to be unintended consequences. It's going to be a lot of, of situations we want to apply them. So what do we do about it? Let's talk about some just a couple of basic practical things. And, and frankly, we could spend hours talking about, you know, what you could do with it and, and how you secure it and what you do about that. But I, I want to present a couple of really basic practical things that everybody should should um Maybe not, maybe not should do, but but um, are definitely worth worth considering. So the first one, I'm just going to the next slide, is an acceptable use policy or security policy. So the screenshots here are are a generalized example of, of the policy that, that Steve mentioned before that we created. But what you want to outline for for folks is whether you're using or developing AI, you want folks to know what the expectations are. What is your company? What is your organization? What are you willing to do with it? How far are you willing to take it? Um, and 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 what kinds of information, what kinds of things you're doing, should people be be open to doing these things? And that depends on where the model's hosted too. If you're hosting it yourself, um, maybe you can put more sensitive data than you would if it was being hosted publicly on the internet, for example. Um, it's important to note that you want these policies not to outline just how your people are using AI, but how you're building AI as well. There are a lot of frameworks out there around, around ethical development and use of AI that I would that I would recommend exploring too. But you want to make sure that whatever policies, whatever rules of the road you're you're outlining for folks, you want to make sure it's not just how you're using AI other people built, but how it applies to AI you're building yourself as well. And let's go on to the next one, please. The next one is more of a, a more practical kind of consideration is assess the risk. Risk assessment is something most people in business and especially people in security and 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 and, and risk have been doing for, for a very long time. Um, the lessons we've learned and how to do threat modeling, how to put those things together can be applied to what we're doing as well here. These, uh, you need to consider situations like what happens if the AI you're using or have built is used wrong? What happens if it applies wrong? What happens if an attacker comes at it, either the model itself or the systems the model runs on? And what happens if it just flies away like a drone you've lost control of, right? It's it's um, You need to be prepared for those circumstances and you need to have contingency plans to deal with them. Um, the books here are perfect examples uh, of, of, you know, these are some of my, my kind of favorite books, but I want to point out the fact that how to lie statistics how to lie with statistics is an interesting idea because it was based on the idea that statistics can be made to say anything. LLMs and some of the other AI stuff we've talked about are statistical models, and they themselves will say anything based on what they think you're asking them to do. So keep in mind and take everything that comes out with a grain of salt and recognize that they're built with millions and billions of data points and, and input data um, and a lot of people using them all over the world, which means that even if the probability of something truly harmful coming out of it is minuscule, um, the law of very large numbers, as the improbability pencil describes it, or a pure black swan event, as as um, Nassim Taleb said it, if the really bad thing could happen, even even only you know 0.0001% of the time, if there's hundreds of millions of people using things on a daily basis, then it's guaranteed those bad things are going to happen, and you need to prepare for it. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, everybody. Uh, for the insights, a, a lot of content to cover, obviously, regarding this topic. Um, this is one that both excites me, but for the first time in my career working in technology, I think I've actually been nervous around how a technology might have impacts because there's so many broad impacts. Uh, you know, Jordan and Steve mentioned, you know, assessing the risks. Also important to balance that out with assessing the opportunities, right? We always want to assess our risks relative to the opportunities. And so there's a lot of exciting things to be, you know, focused on when it comes to artificial intelligence. And there are also things like Steve and Jordan mentioned we need to be cautious about. Uh, and so balancing those two is, is really, really key. Uh, so just in wrapping up, I'm going to say we're going to send out the recording of the presentation uh, to everybody. So you'll receive an email from our colleague Stephen Cameron, uh, who will take care of that, uh, as well as information regarding our next session. The AI policy, I just saw a comment come in regarding that. Um, when Stephen sends out that email, please respond to him that you're interested in receiving that AI acceptable use policy, and we'll make sure that that gets to everybody who requests it uh, very, very timely. Uh, and so 
any questions, please feel free to reach out with us post uh, event. Otherwise, look for that email from Stephen Cameron, which includes our video and our slide deck. And we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, artificial intelligence uh, event. Thank you very much and have a great day, everybody.